mission of our church is transforming lives that transform the world. And I keep repeating that because I feel like repetition is good when we're teaching our church. What are we about? We're about transforming lives that transform the world. We believe that when someone comes into a church, if they encounter Jesus in a real way, that that transformation in them was going to affect and impact the world. And that's really how we do it. We don't really do it with a guy preaching. Although, you know, we're not against preaching. We're going to preach the Word. But really, the real transformation happens with every single one of us walking out our life and being salt and light everywhere we go and running into people because discipleship can't happen from the pulpit. Can I get an amen from anybody? If, 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 if discipleship happened from the pulpit, we'd have a lot more disciples. But how many of you know that we can have big, big churches but not really have a lot of disciples? We can have big, big churches where everybody comes to church on Sunday, but their lifestyle Monday through Saturday doesn't match the thing that they're being taught on Sunday. Can I get an amen from anybody? And that doesn't mean that I'm against church. I'm, I'm against the culture. I'm for the kingdom. And so God gives us vision to see because God, God never really, uh, if, you, if you read the Bible, when Jesus spoke to the crowds, the crowds were there, but most of the crowds were there because they heard about this guy that could give them something. He could give them healing. He could break bread and multiply it and feed them. They came, but, but when it got hard, you read the stories in the Bible, they walked away. There was a point in the Bible where Jesus actually said, but unless you can eat my blood, uh, drink my blood and eat my body, you can't have any part of me. And everybody left. <laughs> everybody heard that. And they said, this dude's crazy. He even turned to the 12 that had been following him and said, are you going to leave me? And they told him, where are we going to go? Amen. You have the words of life. Where else can we go? I say that because I just want you to understand that when you, I'm not saying don't come to church. I'm saying we should come to church. We should come and hear, and there's a level of discipleship and hearing and learning that you get in a corporate environment. There's a corporate anointing. There's unity. There's family. There's, there's God is working. When you join a church, he's basically transforming you. Don't raise your hands, but I know there's people in here who would rather be alone right now. Some of y'all were excited about getting around people this morning, but some of y'all would be fine on the couch, watching on live stream, <laughs> avoiding, right? Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth. I just know there's different kinds of people, but yet, but so God is transforming us. He's trying to get the one that loves to get around people to get by himself with him. To learn how to just don't be around people. Don't make it about people all the time. Get alone with me. And then he's trying to get the loner to say, you need to get around people. <laughs> I need to change you. you, you because I love people. Some of us are trying to avoid people and God loves people. He's saying, I'm transforming you so that you, can tra so that you can be the catalyst to transform someone else. Now, when I say that, you all know what I mean. People don't change people. God changes people. But he uses people to change people. He uses us to, cat, to be the catalyst to tell our story. So we talked about transformation. It's a process. Everybody say process. Everybody in here is in the process. I'm in the process. Every leader is in the process. Every person is in a pro God is peeling things off of me daily. He's exposing my pride, my arrogance to me all the time. He exposes when I'm thinking wrong. You know, I'll say something to somebody and I'll walk away and the Holy Spirit will be like, you should have not said that. Amen. You're the pastor of the church. <laughs> Does it, has anybody ever said anything and walked away and said, mm, man, shouldn't have said that. I, that came off wrong, right? So relax, you're in the process, you're in the right place. You're in a room full of in the process, people. And sometimes we, we, we try to make church like you're, you're coming here and, and you're trying to become something like that I am or that a leader is. And, and, and if you got really close to them, you'd realize that there's some stuff that they're dealing with and we're all in that process, all right? 
I'm trying to diffuse, I'm, I'm tr because that keeps us from growing and that keeps people from church because they are thinking, I don't fit that mold. I, I'm not that kind of person. I'm not like a church person. Well, none of us were church people. We all started not being church people, and along the way, what happened is we encountered God in a real, tangible in, in experience with God, and it transformed me, changed me. We talked about obedience, remember? We have to be obedient to the word. Our obedience that's rooted in a love. God doesn't want an obligatory obedience from you. He doesn't want you to be like your kid. My example was when your kid throws the trash at the house. If you ever ask your kid to throw the trash, he stomps around, he gets it done, but you just kind of like, man, can you do it with a smile, please? I mean, I just paid the light bill, I paid the mortgage, I, put, I, just, I just took you out to eat to CeCe's Pizza, paid all the pizza, and for you and your friends, and I just want you to take the trash out in a good attitude. I mean, right? Some of us follow God with a bad attitude. Because we feel like we're, we're, we have an obligation to do it. And, and you, some of us are even serving out of obligation even today. We're, we're, you, you, some of them, they might be in the back. Some of them are, are like signed up to serve in the three-year-olds and they've got a bad attitude. And he's saying, I want the three-year-olds taken care of, but I want you to do it because you love me. And because you recognize that I did something for you. And I want it to be like something that comes out of you. You know what I'm, you know, you're hearing me. I want, I, want, <laughs> I want it to be something that comes out of you that's genuine because you love me and you're, you just want to do it for me. It's the le you have this attitude like it's the least I can do is serve him in that manner. It's important for transformation. He's trying to transform us into that. How many of you know that doesn't come natural? And how many of you know that it can, it can start good and not end good? And then, and then I talked about being built to last. He didn't build us to just be a flash in the pan. He doesn't want your transformation to be one year. He doesn't want it to be like a New Year's resolution and that the statistics show that by now every single one of you has fallen off your New Year's resolution. There might be two of you that are still on it, but you're hanging on by a thread. Right? You may, anybody made, how many of y'all made a New Year's resolution? Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of y'all, y'all just said, for, I just know, <laughs> forget it. I'm not even going to go there. Is that, is, we get in that mode, like, I'm not even going to try. You got 30 years of doing them, and I haven't done them once. You know, a lot of times, and I'm not saying that, that New Year's resolutions are the answer to everything, but we kind of get like that when we're following God. We get to a place where we just don't try anymore. Some of y'all are here today and you just barely got here because you're thinking about, is this really worth it? Does this really work? I'm about to give up. Or I, some of you have already given up. You used to sit in the front, now you sit in the back. Closer to the door ready to get out of here as soon as the thing's over. Just, I want to bolt out of here. I don't want to talk to anybody about my stuff. I'm not, not willing to be open to anything to be transformed. And it's all on the inside, right? Because on, on the outside, you, you'd never say that. But on the inside, we're dying. We've disconnected. Our foundation's cracked. Whatever you've walked through, whatever you're walking through, whatever's changed in your life, you've gotten to a place where you're giving up. I'm here to tell you today that he doesn't want you to give up. Amen. I'm here to tell you today that you're one step from turning and all you have to do is to turn to him, make one turn to him and he will come running to you. And I'm not talking about you getting more connected in the church. I'm not talking about you serving somewhere. I'm not talking about you giving. I'm not talking about what I need from you. I'm talking about that if you connect with him, all of those other things, they're products of you connecting to him. 
See, when a church has a financial problem or a church has a, an issue with their people giving and being generous, it's really a problem with a connection with the source of where that comes from. And so many times in the church, we get into the situation where we want to teach on it because we think you don't get it, but it, it, it's not that you don't get it here, it's that you haven't got it here. And the longest distance for somebody to get something is the distance from here to here. That's a long 12 inches. Many people have it here. Many people try to understand God here, but he wasn't made to be understood here. I'm not saying that we can't be intellectual and we can't be intelligent and we can't study to show ourselves approved, but that is not where he connects. He didn't say that he was going to regenerate your, your, your mind to have a connection with him. He regenerates your spirit man. Your spirit man is what died in the garden with Adam, it was your spirit man that died, and he comes and he regenerates your spirit because God is spirit, and we have to connect with him in spirit. But we use our mind to connect with him in spirit, but, we, but, but without spirit, you can't use your mind to connect to him. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah? Understand? Hi, babe. I always look there to see if I'm okay. Turn, turn to Romans 12. So we talked about transforming and obedience and building to last. And the word that came to me for this Sunday is called, is sacrifice. In Romans 12 in verse one, and I don't know if I'm hearing a ring. Are you hearing that ring? If I can just, somebody can take care of that, that would be great. Um, Thank you. Romans 12 and 1 says, tell me amen if you're there. Any, in that scripture it says, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take Romans 12 and 1, and we're going to kind of dissect that thing into the, what the words are saying in this scripture. And, and I, I, I'm going to do this this way so that you can begin to read your word this way. Okay, so everything that I'm doing it's not something for me only, it's something that I want to teach you on when you read the word, that you pay attention to some of the word choice and some of the tone of what's happening in the scripture. Because sometimes we kind of read the scripture overall and we get the overall message, but we miss a lot of the detail message that God is trying to tell us. You understand what I'm, yes? Okay. So, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I remember I bought my girls one of those wooden swing sets. Anybody got a wooden swing set? It came with a, a million pieces. I'm kidding. It wasn't a million, but it seemed like a million. When I opened the box, when I saw the picture at the store, you know, in me, I was like, I can do this. I mean, it's four poles. It's a deck. I got a, I got a drill. I got this. But when I opened the box and I started sorting all the parts, I was like, holy cow. I mean, the whole yard was full of these. And everything looked, some of those things looked the same, but one of them was, you should have two A's and two B's and two C's and two D's but when I pulled all the A's, B's, and C's out, they weren't marked. And they were all like seven eighths off, one inch difference. I'm just telling you, when I started, I had these, I, I, I mean, I had a, I even, I think I, I even had a tool belt, you know, because I was, and I'm not much of a handy guy, but I just wanted to look the part, you know. I put my jeans on and tucked my boots in my, in my jeans, you know, so I, you know. My work boots. You know what I'm talking about? Any, don't raise your hand. You know. I got my steel toe. I, I don't even know why I have steel toe boots, but I have a pair just to say I have one. So that when I hang out with Mitch, I look like Mitch. 
And I began to, to, to put this thing together, and lo and behold, I had an A mixed with a B, so when I went to go put something on, it didn't match. And I mean, I, I put that up, took it down at least three times before I, but you know what I never did was I never read the instructions, like, I never really read them. Like, I skimmed them. You know, like, I got them, and I looked at the picture, and I skimmed them, and I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I got that, yeah, yeah, you know. The ladies are laughing because they know that you do that, guys. So I didn't, I was careless with the instruction of what was, what I needed to build, right? So now I'm not talking about a swing set anymore. I'm talking about our life and how God gave us an instruction manual of what to build and how to build and what to follow. And we get careless and we skim it and we kind of know the word, but we really don't know the word or we misquote the word, or we don't spend enough time meditating on the word to under, really understand what is he really saying here in this scripture, and then we are disappointed when the thing that we build shakes. It's sh- it doesn't last, it's not built to last. When, 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 when that swing set came with all of the hardware, I should never have to go back to the hardware store to buy more hardware. <laughs> if I have to go back to the hardware store, that means I used something incorrectly. Man, you can learn a lot by just doing stuff at the house. And you listen to the Lord, he'll speak to you. So he says in this scripture, so, so I, I say that because that, that's why I, I feel like when we read the word, not just in the church, but when you read it at home, don't be in a hurry. You know, some of us get into our word reading and we give ourselves five, 10 minutes. Uh, some of us are on that one, one year Bible app on the phone. And you know, I know that I know, I know what happens is you start reading it. And if it's like not interesting, you kind of like go faster. <laughs> you go faster on it and, and, and you get to the end and you flick it and it gives you a little check mark and you feel like, oh, I finished. And you're more interested in finishing what the word, finishing your assignment that day than you are in allowing God to speak to us of what he's saying in his word, right? And so we get so tied up to this task of saying, I've got to read my word, I've got to read my word, and I've got to move it along. And, and we, we don't want to be behind. I'm behind. I get behind. I haven't ever read, I've read the whole Bible in a year, but I've never done it in a year. I, I, so I've read the app in a year, but it takes me longer because I get stuck because I refuse to make it a, a checklist. And so if the Lord holds me up in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and I can't get past it and I find myself wanting to scroll and hit next just so that I can get past it, I stop myself and I say, no, Lord, I'm gonna read every single word. I'm gonna read it. And I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to care that I'm behind. I'm not going to gauge that as being behind because you know that I'm reading, you, I'm reading this thing every day. But I need a word from you. We've got to get to the place where we need a word from him and we're not trying to just do the task for him and just trying to say to, to, so that we can tell everybody, man, I read my one year every year. You know, I even got the, the history to show you that I've hit every day, every year, never missed a day. Hallelujah. So when we read this scripture, the first thing I read is the word, I urge you. When Paul wrote to the Roman, to the Romans, the the Christians in Rome, he said, I urge you. How many of y'all know the word urge has a different meaning than if you said, hey, I'm suggesting to you that you do these things. He comes back and he says, I'm not suggesting to you, I urge you urge you. How many of y'all ever urged your children? What does that look like? We have an upstairs house and those stairs are the best place to keep folded laundry that's got to go up the stairs. And I don't live upstairs and my wife doesn't live upstairs. My girls live upstairs. Right, so I, I I look at it this way. I'm do my wife is doing the laundry and folding it. That's already good, right? So 
That contract ends at the stairs. <laughs> it's FOB, the stairs. If you're in logistics, you know what I'm talking about. It's not FOB, their room in their drawer. Because we're, we're trying to teach them a level of responsibility of saying, listen, I'll wash it for you and I'll fold it for you, but I'm gonna set it right here and I want you to take it and walk up the stairs and put it in your drawer. Is that right? He says, I urge, sometimes I have to urge them to do that. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's an, you, sometimes we have to urge them and Paul is telling, telling the, the Romans, I urge you to present yourself. The second thing you need to understand about this scripture, he's urging, but he's also saying, it's your job to present yourself to God a certain way. Do you hear, you, you see the difference in, in just relying on that God's going, God does do everything for us, but there are moments where we have to make a decision to do something and to present ourselves. So he's saying, I urge you, I'm commanding you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you with fervor to take yourself and present yourself by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Doesn't that sound weird to be living and to be sacrificed? Does everybody ever think like, well, how do you live and be sacrificed? I mean, if you're sacrificed, when I think sacrificed, I think something died. But yet God is saying, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I think we, that needs to be looked at. So many times we read that and we say, okay, yeah, I kind of get it, but we don't really get it. And we have to teach uh, uh, ourselves what is it that God wants from me. If he wants me to present myself as a living and sacrifice, listen, holy and acceptable to God. When we do what God calls us to do, it makes us holy and acceptable to God. So becoming a living sacrifice makes us holy and acceptable you ever wonder, like, be holy, for I am holy, be holy, that, that scripture? How, how do I be holy? One, one, of the, one of the ways is you offer and present your body as a living sacrifice. You become a sacrifice unto the Lord with your entire life, and it makes you holy and acceptable to God. And I love this next word, he says, which is your reasonable service of worship. Sometimes we can preach that and people in the audience will say, man, you know, you guys are just too hard. That's hard. But the Bible says, no, it's reasonable. It makes sense. Why does it make sense? See, it only makes sense when you understand and you get a revelation of the cross. The, living your life Holy and acceptable to God only makes sense to those that when they think of that, the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he picked me up, how he turned me around, how he set my feet on solid ground. See, when you get that revelation, this thing becomes reasonable. When we come to church and all we think is they're trying to get, you haven't had the revelation yet, and so this stuff doesn't make sense. It's saying, what does he want me to do? Die? Be alive? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't want to do that. I, because you haven't had an encounter with God and the revelation that he's pulled you out of something and put you in something, and it's reasonable to me. It becomes reasonable. So if when you get to a place where it's not reasonable, you've got to go back to your relationship. That's why the Bible says that the road is narrow. The road to heaven is narrow. You know, we all have a different definition of narrow, right? Some of y'all think a side street is narrow. Some of y'all think a path in a, a cow path in the woods is narrow. Some of y'all think that a little slither like this is narrow. So what is narrow? 
Some of you think that I tend too narrow. <laughs> Some of y'all wish they'd add another lane or two. They've already got 15 or however many they got. The Bible says that many will come to him in that day. Listen, listen to me. Many will come in that day and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things for you? Didn't, didn't we cast out devils and didn't we do? And he's, there's gonna be people. That means, you see, those aren't people that don't know him. Those are people who think they know him who th- have been going to church, have been going to the Bible studies, have been serving at KCM, have been w- serving at the ranch, have been going to intense, but they don't know him. Why do I preach that on a Sunday morning? Because it's important, because you've got to know him before he comes back. You, 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 you have to have a relationship with him. You have to know him like the one that picked you up and turned you around and when you think about him, you get thankful and you just start looking back and going, man, he really did a work in me. Woo, he did a work in me. It's reasonable. Tell your neighbor it's reasonable. Dr. Cole said this. I love this. It's reason- when it's reasonable, it's not too heavy. Dr. Cole said, if you, want to alert, if you want to lighten your burden, then change the yoke. And if you understand yokes, these are the things that they put on the oxen to pull. The Bible says, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when you get into church, So, you know, we know that the burden of the Lord, the burden of the world is heavy. But when you get into church, you can get into a religious yoke that becomes too heavy to bear. And you can get into this thing where you're trying to to pull something that you weren't supposed to pull, that he's supposed to be pulling for you. And you've lost connection on that thing. And he's saying, you've got to recognize when the burden gets heavy and it shouldn't be heavy. And you've got to change out of that religious yoke into the Christ yoke. Because the Christ yoke is easy. If you're feeling heavy with church stuff, you've got to revisit why are you feeling heavy? It's supposed to be the highlight of our week, not the obligation of the weekend. We're supposed to be walking around going, I can't wait to Sunday to get here. Some of us are like, hey, tomorrow's Sunday. (laughs) We've got to be there. And... We're taking care of the threes. <laughs> There's a shift that has to happen in our minds. It's reasonable. Tell somebody it's reasonable. He even says it's our worship. Becoming a living sacrifice is an act of worship. See, so some of us, we've gotten to a place where we think worship are the slow songs. When you get into, when, when you, you, we, we, we think that when, 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 oh, it's worship time. But worship is the giving time. And worship is this time. And worship happens on Monday when you get up and you go to the job that he gave you, that he gave you the ability to do, that he's watched over for you, that he has favor for you. When you get up out of your bed, when you breathe, That's worship. I'm breathing him in, and I'm going to the job that he gave me to do. Your whole life is a life of worship. That's what he's saying. You're supposed to be a living sacrifice, and everything that you do should should worship him when you go to work. When you meet people at work that are difficult to deal with, and you begin to think, man, God made them, and he loves them, and he's trying to reach them. How can I use... How, how are you working here, Lord, and how can you use me to, to just encourage this brother right now? When you get to the water cooler and they're talking about everybody, you don't go in and start with them. 
You begin to go in there and be a catalyst of change. How do you do that? You know, you ever ask yourself, like, how do I be, you go to the, they're, they're talking negative about, about, you don't have to go in there and say, hey, y'all need to stop talking. Don't be that guy. Because then they'll see you coming. They'll be like, oh, here, uh, here comes Robert. Oh, man. You hear the situation and you say, you know what, guys? I'm going to pray. I'm going to begin to pray. I'm a man of prayer, and I believe that if I pray, the Bible says that God directs the heart of the king. Amen. And that maybe, maybe a, 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 an HR complaint, you know, it, it'll get me so far, but what I really want is for the heart of the king to change. So that when the change comes, it wasn't that I made the HR complaint. It was that I went into my closet and I said, Lord, I pray for that person in charge right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you change him and redirect him. And then when it happens, you can say, this is the Lord, man. That's the Lord. You know what? If nobody else believes you, you'll believe it. Because you prayed. And your faith will go from faith to another level of faith. And you'll begin to pray for other things because you'll see him begin to answer the small things. It's our worship. So how do I become a living sacrifice? That same scripture in verse 2 says, let me tell you, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. That's easy to say, but if we could do it, we would have already done it. And it's a process, and it's a, it's a never-ending process work to not be conformed to the culture of the world. In 1 John 2, 15 through 16, listen to this. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <laughs> you need to write this scripture down, and you need to read 1 John and 2 John. And I know that some of y'all were in Bible study today, and he preached these scriptures. We haven't talked so just tell, let me tell you, it's the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit, you know, we wonder how the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works as he puts it in him. He begins to preach it because it's in him. I get up here, I start telling him right before I came up, I said, I'm in 1 John 2. He's like, I just talked about that. So God has something for us today in 1 John 2. And what he's saying in this scripture, he says that if, if the love, if we love the things of the world, then the love of the Father is not in us. That's a very black and white statement. That means that we cannot say that we love the things of the world and have the Father in us. It, what does it mean to not, the Father not be in us? That means that he's not in us, that he, he's not part of us. Because if he's in you, he begins to change what you love. You begin to love what he loves. You begin to hate what he hates. And when you see things, they become disgusting to you. They become, oh, I don't want to do that. Ah, something in you says, I don't care to do that. It disrupts your spirit. You watch a movie and it disrupts your spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It, it begins to disrupt you. For all that is in the world, verse 16 says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world and its desires are passing away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. You know, if there's something that, you, that we need to understand is some of us give our entire being and effort to things that are of this world. And those things, the Bible says, are all passing away. In other words, there will be a time where it won't matter where you work. It won't matter what degree you have. It won't matter what you're chasing. It won't matter about the new house. It won't matter about the truck. It won't matter about the van. It won't matter 
how you look. It doesn't matter about your clothes. There's going to be a day where none of those things will matter, and the only thing that will matter is Jesus and your relationship with him. And we live our lives, our entire temporal lives, just bombarded and burdened with everything that's going to pass away. And he, that's why he's saying, my yoke is easy. I saw one of our friends, Stanley Scott, he has a church, uh, Faith Family, right? Is it Faith Family Out Center or something? Um, he did a series the other day, and he called it, The Joneses Are Broke. And you're trying to keep up with somebody that's broke. (laughs) I remember when I was younger, I'd go outside to the, we live in a cul-de-sac, and we'd start, we'd get around and have a little barbecue, and everybody's talking about what they're doing, and, you know, everybody's talking about they're going to Disneyland, and they're going here, they're going there, and we're sitting there going, man, we can't afford to do that. How do they do that? They go on a cruise like every three months. They're on a cruise. They're giving me the key. Can you watch my house? We're going on a cruise. Am I the only one that thinks that way? Or, and I'm sitting there going, how do they do that? I mean, I know. I, and, and that time I wasn't pastoring. I was working outside. Had a really good job making really good money, you know. And, and, and you know, I was still kind of like, man, I can't do that. How do they do that? How do they do that? How do they do that? How do they well, you know, you don't know how they do that. Some of them have a credit card that they rotate. And when they get a balance transfer letter in the mail, they transfer that balance over here, right? And then they, oh, we got room on this one. I just transferred the balance. And I don't have to make a payment for six months over here, zero interest. And now I've got this one available. And you start going on cruises and doing what you do, doing, you know? And then you get another letter for another transfer. You say, oh, I'll transfer this one. Pretty soon, man, all you're doing is shuffling money. Send it over here. $70,000 in debt. Mm, I might be hitting some nerves. It got quiet in here. <laughs> I'm sorry if I caught on to your scheme. <laughs> hey, let me just, can I, can I, like, release you from this? Let me tell you, I've done, the reason I can talk about it is I've done it. <laughs> And I'm not in it anymore. I woke up. I woke up and I said, I ain't doing that anymore. I've done it. I've gotten out of debt like five times. So you're in the right place. I, I, I've done, I learned from, I, I, I'm, I'm not a, you know, somebody, people, some people say you, you should learn from wisdom from other people's mistakes. I'm a little bit, I'm a hard-headed guy, so I, I, I kind of got to go through it sometimes to learn it. But once I learn it, I learn it. Amen. Amen. I'm 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 I'm, I'm picking up on who's the hard-headed ones in here. They start amening me. The beginning of becoming a living sacrifice is not conforming. So what happens to a Christian is when you get born again, there has to become a process of detachment from the world. You have to begin the process of detaching yourself from the things of the world. And sometimes that is very, very difficult because sometimes that includes sometimes friendships that, that are not healthy. For me personally, as a, as a man, I used to be a big hunter and, and, a, and I had to detach myself from some of those circumstances. There was, there, I, not all of them, some of them were fine with me and, what the, and the decisions that I'd made to live. But, but some of them, it just didn't, it didn't bring me to where I wanted to be. And so I detached. I didn't throw away. I just detached. Right? Somebody told me one time when I was, uh, I used to be a big drinker. And they said, man, I said, I, I told an older guy, I was like, hey, I want to quit drinking. What, how do I quit drinking? How do I stop doing that? He's like, well, quit buying it. <laughs> he says, no that's the wisdom from the old guys. He just said, just quit buying it. I was like, well, that's, you know, I wanted him to lay hands on me, slap oil on my head. 
something to happen. He's like, quit buying it, man. That sounds simplistic for my high road people. I know, I know, I know, I get it, but I'm just. The world is categorized into three categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of the things that we need to detach ourselves are in three categories, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. What you see causes you to lust, right? What you feel, your feeling, and your pleasure will cause you to sin. And the pride of life, we all have pride in our lives, and we all are striving for, sometimes when we are striving for something so much, and we've been working on it so long that we'll lie, cheat, and steal to get it. We'll sacrifice our families to get it. We'll do things that we shouldn't do to get it. And God is saying, you've got to detach yourself. You've got to not conform to the lust of the eyes. You've got to, so how do, you, how do you control the lust of the eyes? You've got to spend more time gazing on him than what you're gazing on what you can have. Your gaze, what, you, what is your gaze set on? Have you, ever, have you ever gazed at something? You ever go somewhere beautiful where there's mountains or landscapes and the gaze just, it captures your gaze. We have to begin to learn how to walk with the Lord where our gaze is set on God and we control what comes in our eyes. Halftime shows at Super Bowl, which is coming up. I don't know who's playing, but sometimes those for men are a tough one. Football games with cheerleaders are tough for men. Oh, Jesus, I'm going there. Because it is. Some social media sites, some websites are tough for men. They're tough for women, too. You know what's tough for women? When women get on Facebook and they see all the other women bragging about how awesome their man is. That's tough for women. Don't, don't disagree with me, women. I know it's tough. I told somebody the other day, you know, you go on Facebook and you take, you take a picture of date night. And there's women that are just screaming, going, I wish my husband would take me on a date. Can I, they're not on date night. He's taking a selfie. <laughs> a real date night, that phone would be in the truck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give all the married guys free advice. Leave your phone at home when you go to dinner and just tell her, you bring yours. So if the kids need to get us, they can get you on yours. I don't have my phone. Because a woman wants, when you take, listen up, man, this is free. This is not even in the, this is just free. <laughs> I'm going to help you. I'm really going to help you today. They want your undivided attention when they sit at the table. They want you to hold their hand. They want you to look at them in the eye. They, want, they don't want to talk about your stuff. They want to talk about their stuff. If you want to talk about your stuff, come to Man Church and we'll hook you up with a mentor. I'm trying, I'm not kidding. You'll go to another level. Another, you'll do the dishes without being asked. I mean, when I do the dishes, I mean, you'd have thought I went to Jared's. <laughs> I mean, she walks out of that kitchen like, babe, you are too good to me. You just. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on to something, man. I'm, I'm winning. <laughs> What's that got to do with sacrifice? It has everything to do with sacrifice. I've chosen to not make it about me. I've chosen when I'm around her, I want to make it about her. Why? Because I love her. And I love God. And deep down on the desire of every man is for, I, I love when my wife looks at me and says, I've got a great husband. Deep down, listen, listen to me, all you men that are in here, you know that deep down on the inside, you just want, you, you want that. Some of you all say, no, nah, I don't. 
I saw a sign the other day on Facebook, and it said, uh, many men will die this year of stubbornness. And then at the bottom it said, no, we won't. <laughs> that just defines men. No, we won't. Ain't nobody dying today. <laughs> sacrifice. How do you become a living sacrifice? You don't conform to the world. You see, as I was preaching and as we were going, you were thinking about not conforming to things that would make Jesus look at you uh, in a certain way. So it's, it's the obvious, it's the sin stuff. But I'm talking about, if you really want to make it practical, it's how you treat your wife and wives, how you treat your husbands and, and, and men, men, how you parent your kid. In all of those, see, he, see, when we get to heaven, the Bible says that we will neither be taken or given in marriage. Did you know that? When we get to heaven, there is no marriage in heaven because there can be no other relationship except you and the Lamb. That sounds kind of crazy, but I, I, I can't have an affection to her when I get there. My, he's so jealous that my affection can only be for him. But he gave me her to teach me about him. Because in her, is the, it, she was created in the image of God, and I was created in the image of God, and he's saying, I want you to know me from the feminine side as much as you know me from the masculine side. Because women aren't less than. Y'all look surprised. <laughs> There's things in women that, we, that, that show the attributes of God. The nurturing that comes so natural. The, the tenacity of a woman to carry a child for nine months and to give birth and then to care for it and to get up. Nobody, did you notice that it's only the guys that got to get nudged to get up and take care of the baby? Who nudges the girl? <laughs> Something on the inside nudges her. She was made different. I know that's unpopular today. <laughs> but there's a difference. It's, a, it's, a, it's different. She was made different that there's an elbow on the inside that says, check on the baby. <laughs> <laughs> There's no elbow on the outside. Now, she becomes the elbow for the men. Hey, can you help me tonight, please? I've been getting up for eight days straight. But there's a tenacity in her, and listen to me, men, if we're not careful, we begin to lose the fact that what's in her is God in her. And God is trying to it, it manifest himself in our wives. That's why he gives us wives. That's why we have children, so that we can understand how he feels as a parent to me, how he feels. You know, when, when I want to give up on my kids, I think, well, he never gave up on me. And all of it is a, is a long, required class that you have been chosen to take yeah. <laughs> if you're in college. It's a requirement. You can't move into eternity without taking this class. And some of y'all got variations of the class because I know there's statistics will show me that some of y'all are alone right now. Some of y'all are single today doing what you've got to do. Some of y'all have gone through a divorce. Some of y'all have gone through whatever it is that you've gone through. But your track has that in your track. And God doesn't waste a thing. He wants to reveal himself to you through all of it. He wants to reveal himself. If you're single today, he wants, to be, he wants to be your husband. He's showing you, I want to be your husband. I want to be the one you rely on. Listen, today, as we close, the word is powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide between soul and spirit. It can discern the thoughts and the actions of the heart. That's what the word says. If I can get the band to come. 2 Timothy 3.16 says it's breathed out by God. The very words that we read out of these pages were breathed out by God. And they're profitable for teaching, for rebuking, and for correcting and training John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was what? The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word prevents things like pride and arrogance. It prevents the turning away, the small things that turn us away. If we get in the Word, we can correct it and not turn away. 
It ensures a generational reign. And the only way we can reign as a, as a kingdom people is to have the Word in us to ensure that we put it in our children and that we have a generational reign. You know what the most important thing is that I think we lose sight of sometimes, church? Is that he's asking us to become a living sacrifice. You know why? Because he's a living sacrifice. And listen to me, for many of us, we think he's dead. We think Jesus is dead, that he died on the cross, and we forget the resurrection, and we forget the, listen to me, right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, a living sacrifice, making intercession for me, for you, for our children. He's a living sacrifice, and he's saying, I want you to be my image on the earth. I want you to be resurrected in your life and become a living sacrifice for other people. He is our living sacrifice. Stand to your feet today as we close. <laughs>